Good morning, everyone. Happy Thursday morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. We are examining the disciples' questions in Matthew chapter 24 when Jesus predicted the fall of Jerusalem and the temple. I've shared with you that the vast majority of commentators believe that the disciples were either confused, they were wrong, when they asked, tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? They were just wrong. They were confused. They were ignorant. Because, in the mind of the commentators, they were wrong to conflate the fall of Jerusalem with the coming of the Lord and the end of the age. Now, I want you to grasp how important this is. If the disciples were not ignorant, confused, or wrong, to combine to understand that the fall of Jerusalem was to be the coming of the Lord and the end of the age, then essentially that means futurism is dead. Because if they were right, if they were right in believing, if they were right in linking the fall of, of Jerusalem and the temple with the coming of the Lord and the end of the age, then guess what? That means that the futurist views which deny that connection and which claim that the disciples were ignorant, confused, or wrong, it's the modern futurist views that are wrong. Now, I don't know of a more powerful way to illustrate this than to realize, number one, when the disciples asked about the, quote, end of the age, they, they used a very distinctive Greek word. Uh, Matthew uses this term only, uh, well, actually this term is only used six times in the New Testament, if my count is correct. Matthew uses them the preponderant number of times, number one in Matthew 13, Number two, Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, I'll be with you until the end of the age. And number three, it only appears one time outside of Matthew. That's in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 26, which says Christ appeared at the end of the age. Now, I think it's pretty obvious, isn't it, that Jesus did not appear at the end of the Christian age. He did not appear at the end of time. Those are just prima facie true. He did appear at the end of the Old Covenant age, however. Okay, so the disciples asked, what should be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Did you know that in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus told three parables using this distinctive Greek term? The very first one, the most in-depth, is the parable of the wheat and the tares. The sower went out and sowed, the devil, the, the enemy, came and sowed tares amongst the wheat. The servants of the master came and said, there, there are tares in amongst the wheat. What shall we do? And the master said, let them grow together until the time of the harvest. Now, I'm going to pick it up, and I'm going to begin reading with verse 39. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. Now, watch this. The harvest is the end of the age. That's the identical Greek term as found in Matthew 24, verse 3, that the disciples were asking about. So here is Jesus talking about the end of the age. In Matthew 24, the disciples are asking for a sign of the end of the age. Now watch. Again, verse 39, the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. I want you to ask yourself the question, in what age was Jesus living? Was Jesus living in the Christian age? No. He was living in the Mosaic age. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, made under the law, Torah. Jesus did not live one day on earth in the Christian age. He clearly did not appear in the Christian age. And when he said that harvest will be at the end of this age, which, by the way, is well attested in, in the Greek manuscripts, 
then guess what? He was talking about the end of the age in which he was living, the Mosaic age. Harvest is at the end of this age. And now watch this. The Son of Man will send out his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And now catch this. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their, of their father. The one who has ears to hear, let him hear. When Jesus said harvest would be at the end of the age, when the Son of Man would come and send out his angels, when the righteous would shine in the kingdom, that is a direct echo, as virtually all critical scholars are agreed, of Daniel chapter 12. In Daniel chapter 12, we have number one, the prediction of the great tribulation, which Jesus quoted in Matthew 24 and said it would occur in his generation. Number two, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall arise, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting condemnation. Now, it's absolutely stunning, absolutely stunning that some former apprentice, Sam Frost, for instance, says, well, you know, the great tribulation of Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, was in the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, but the resurrection of verse 2, that's at the end of time. So Sam Frost stuffs a so far 2,500-year gap between verse 1 and verse 2. Where's the indication of it? Where's the grammatical, linguistic, textual indication of a 2,500-year gap between verse 1 and verse 2. Well, simply stated, there is no ind indication of that. You have to read it into the text, isogetically. Okay, verse 3 is the time of the end when the righteous would shine forth in the kingdom. Daniel was then told, verse 4, to seal up the book because it was for the time of the end. Now in verses 9 and 10, Daniel was told, seal up the book because it would not be fulfilled for many days. Well, you know, here we have another irony. Uh, Anti-preterists tell us, you know, God can't tell time. God doesn't communicate in time. But do you know what they do? When God said something was far off, they say, see, see, God said it was a long time off. A long time. And that means that's 2,000 years. Oh, wait a minute. So God could tell time when something, when he said something was far off, but he said when something was at hand, he didn't know what he was talking about, right? <laughs> Do you see the utter inconsistency of those who oppose covenant eschatology? God can't tell time. Well, that is, unless he's saying something is far off. Now then, yes, sir, he knew exactly what he was talking about. But not, absolutely not, when he said something was about to happen. Okay, now, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, one angel asked another, when shall these things be? When will these things be fulfilled? And the other angel, who stood on the land and on the sea, lifted up his arms and swore by him who lives forever and ever, and he said, it shall be for a time, times and a half time, catch the power of this, and when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all of these things shall be fulfilled. How many of these things? Great tribulation, resurrection, righteous shining forth in the kingdom, time of the end. All of these things. Now, you know, Sam Frost says some of these things would be fulfilled at the time of Antiochus Epiphanes. Some of them will be fulfilled at the end of time. That's not what the text says. You have to pervert the text to get that out of it. When the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all of these things shall be fulfilled. Now watch this. That means that the righteous shining forth in the kingdom would be fulfilled at the time when the power of the holy people is completely shattered. That means that the coming of the Son of Man, the time of the harvest, the end of the age, since it's drawing from Daniel 12, would be when the power of the holy people was completely shattered. 
Matthew 24, Jesus is describing the destruction of the city and the temple, the temple which represented Torah, the power of the holy people. And the disciples tell us what will be the sign of that end of the age. Remember, harvest is at the end of the age, that very distinctive Greek term. Now watch this. Remember, we're told, well, yeah, the disciples are asking about the end of the age, but they think they're asking about the end of the Christian age. They think they're asking about the end of time. Really? Is that what Daniel predicted? Well, if Daniel was predicting the end of time, then that means that the power of Israel, her covenant relationship with Yahweh, is never shattered until the end of time. Well, that's a little troublesome for the amillennial and postmillennial views. But secondly, now, you've got to catch the power of this. In Matthew 13, Jesus tells the parable of the harvest at the end of the age, quoting from Daniel. Daniel said the time of the end, the time of the harvest, would be when the power of the holy people was completely shattered. Well, in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus tells two more parables. And he uses that distinctive Greek term. Now, here's I'm running out of time. Here's what is absolutely critical. Matthew 13, 49. So it will be at the end of the age. Now, this he's just told a parable of the dragnet throwing, being thrown out, gathering all sorts of fish indiscriminately. And Jesus said, so shall it be at the end of the age. Now, watch this. So it will be at the end of the age, that distinctive Greek term. The angels will gather will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, cast them in the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said, he's talking to his disciples, the very disciples that are in Matthew chapter 24, and he says, do you understand these things? And they said, you know, Lord, we don't have a clue what you're talking about. Uh, I, I, we, we just don't understand. No, that's not what they said. They said, yes, Lord. You know what that means? It means that they understood that the harvest, the end of the age harvest, when the righteous would shine forth in the kingdom, would be when the power of the holy people was completely shattered. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus has just predicted the shattering of Israel, the shattering of Jerusalem and Judah and the temple and the disciples, they don't ask what it is. They've already said they understand what it is. They just want a sign of when it will occur. Now here's what that means. If the disciples really were ignorant, confused, or simply wrong in Matthew 24, it means that, number one, they did not understand Jesus' teaching in Matthew 13, but they said they did. So if they said they understood Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 13, but they really didn't, then they lied to him. Do you really want to accuse the apostles? of lying to Jesus about whether or not they understood what he had just explained to them. Now remember Matthew 13, they're saying, explain, interpret the parable. And the interpretation is about the harvest at the end of the age when the righteous would shine in fulfillment of Daniel, which would be fulfilled when the power of the holy people was completely shattered. Once again, the disciples said they understood what that meant but they clearly wanted a sign of when it would occur. There's a humongous difference between understanding what was to happen and even when to a degree, i.e., when the power of the holy people is completely shattered, and, number, and understanding all of that and then wanting to know a sign of when it was about to happen. Folks, I suggest to you there's absolutely no justification whatsoever for saying the disciples were wrong, ignorant, or confused 
in Matthew 24. And if the disciples truly were not ignorant, wrong, or confused, then that means that all and every commentator who says they were, it is that commentator who is wrong. We must bring our understanding into alignment with that which the disciples emphatically and specifically said they understood. Hey, look, please. Go to my website, get a copy of my book, We Shall Meet Him in the Air, The Wedding of the King of Kings. I developed this and I discussed this extensively in this book and a whole lot more. So order the book, We Shall Meet Him in the Air, The Wedding of the King of Kings. Be sure to mention that you saw the offer on YouTube or Facebook, and I'll refund your shipping. Okay, hey, tomorrow we will continue our refutation of Brock Hollett's book, Debunking Preterism. And you don't want to miss it, of course, so we will see you on the flip side.